to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 22. We welcome you today to our study of how to contact the blood of Jesus. You know, blood kind of affects everybody differently. But without Christ's blood, there's no salvation. The Bible clearly teaches that. So today we're asking and thinking about how do you contact the blood of Jesus Christ? We hope that you've got your Bible, that you'll have it out and ready. If you don't, that you'll pause just a minute and grab that as we're going to look to the Word of God in answering this powerful question. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday for worship or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love others, and who are deeply concerned about the souls of men and women. Friend, if you've got a Bible question, maybe you're wondering about salvation or the church or, or any number of religious uh, matters, you'll find people in the Lord's church in your local area who'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you in kindness and love and look at the truth of God's Word. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know God better. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our lessons. They're available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to make that available to you as a digital download or other formats if you need that as well. And friend, we want to encourage you also to check us out on Facebook, like our Facebook page, follow us on that. Great way to keep up with things that we're doing. And then, of course, in our fast-paced world today, where everybody's got a smartphone, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app that's available in the respective play stores. You can get it there, and it's a great way to keep up with our new lessons, what we're doing, and just so that you can know how we're trying to spread the Gospel and reach people with the news of Jesus Christ. And as always... We want to thank you today for joining us for our study. Hope you've got your Bible ready. Let's look to the Word of God together. The sight of blood affects everybody a little differently. If you saw somebody bleeding or you saw a big pool of blood, how would that affect you? Well, here's how it affects people differently. Some people might feel faint. They might even turn white. Might need to sit down. Some people might get sick. There are those who at the sight of blood become sick and nauseous. Today, sadly, in our world, some might be entertained by it due to the desensitization of culture and problems related to that. At the sight of blood, some might be reminded of a bloody event, like war or some tragedy or, or some accident. At the sight of blood, some people might be reminded of, of death, maybe of someone who died close to you and, and, and that event that happened. When you think about the blood of Christ, when you think about the blood of Jesus, and when you think about blood from a biblical perspective, in the Bible, how is the blood represented? How is the blood of Jesus thought of in the Bible? Today we're going to be thinking about how to contact the blood of Christ. But as we do that, we need to see the importance of it and what it represents, and in all reality, while blood represents that red liquid substance, we're talking about something higher than that, something more than just the red fluid that flows out of your veins. What is blood in the Bible? Leviticus chapter 17, 
Verse number 11 is the first indication we have of the importance of blood in the Bible. And I want you to hear what the scripture says in this verse about blood. The Bible records, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. What is blood in the Bible? The first indication we have, life is in the blood. You know, for a long, long time, people, even two or three hundred years ago, in the medical field didn't understand that. If somebody got sick, they kind of thought the opposite of that. They thought that death was in the blood and that the germs were in the blood and that if you could actually let that blood out, you've heard of bloodletting, if you let all as much of that out as you could, you'd let as much as the disease out. We've learned that it's actually quite the opposite and that those kind of scenarios medically were devastating. But what we know from the Bible is blood represents life. And so that's a, that's a picture that we see in the Bible. What else does blood represent in the Bible? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Blood represents sacrifice. And many times when the Bible speaks about blood, especially as it relates to atonement, this is what's being spoken of. Hebrews, Hebrews 9 verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Of course, every Jew realized that. Under the Old Testament system, there were a multiplicity of, and a variety of different sacrifices from the scapegoat to the lamb, to the heifer, to the, to the bull, uh, all, all offered for a variety of sins or problems that may arise. And, and you could imagine that. Let's say a person under the Old Testament sins, he has to go out to the field, get a, a, a bull, that spot or blemish, bring that bull in, cut its throat, all the pro bloody process. And that happened because it became representative of a sacrifice for sin. And yet, here's the problem with that scenario. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 3, and 4, the blood of bulls and goats can never really take away sin. But Hebrews 10, 12 says, this man, Jesus, after it offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And so when we think of blood, don't just think about life. Think about sacrifice. In the Bible, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. The blood is the sacrifice. What else does the blood represent? Open your Bible, if you would, to Matthew chapter 26. And I want you to look in verse number 28. Blood represents covenant. Jesus took the cup and he said, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sin. That, that, that covenant being made in blood. You kind of, maybe you've heard of that, making a blood oath kind of the idea. Well, in the Bible, the blood of Jesus, representative of the new agreement, the new covenant, the new contract God made with man and himself through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And so that, that new law, that new relationship, the, 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 the new standard set in place by blood. Just like in the Old Testament when blood was shed at the giving of the commandments, so today. Blood was shed, and it was representative of the covenant that was made. Consider with me then another thing. Blood represents suffering and sacrifice in the Bible. Look in John chapter 19, and I want you to notice what the scripture says. In John chapter 19, look with me if you would in verse number 34. Blood represents giving of one's life. The words of, of the Bible record this. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. Blood represents sacrifice, it represents uh, suffering, but it also carries the idea of cleansing. Immediately when that, when that sword pierced the side of Jesus, blood and water came out. Listen to Zechariah 13.1. Zechariah prophesies, of a time when there'll be a fountain of cleansing opened in Jerusalem. And that, that time frame, as you search that text, is when New Testament Christianity came about, when the new covenant is installed. And so that time when a fountain's open for cleansing, 
when blood and water flowed from Calvary. Blood is representative of a, a cleansing agent because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Listen to Revelation 1 verse 6. God has washed us in his blood. We are washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's the idea that you find throughout the Bible. And so there's that, with blood, there's that, that cleansing agent because of the sacrifice that was made by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What else does blood represent in the Bible? Blood represents a buying agent. Listen to Acts chapter 20. It's a blood in the Bible is a purchasing agent. Acts chapter 20. Verse number 28, as Paul discusses with the elders in Ephesus about shepherding the flock of God, he reminds them that God has placed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, listen now, which he purchased with his own blood. Blood was a price paid or a purchasing agent for the Lord's church. When Christ died on Calvary, that ultimate most valuable sacrifice of human life purchased the church, the saved, God's own people, the kingdom which God promised would come. And then if you would, look in Revelation chapter 19, verse number 13. As we think about today, contacting the blood of Jesus and, and why it would be essential for a person to do that, notice what the scripture says about blood in Revelation chapter 19. The Bible says, as it is a picture of Jesus and his sacrifice, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The blood in the Bible represents that which clothes one, that which seals one, that which cleanses one and makes one a child of God. And so here's that beautiful picture uh, 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 of the blood of Jesus and how one must be clothed in that, spiritually speaking, so that his sins can, can be washed away. And so in the Bible, it's not just that red liquid substance. It's everything that it represents. It's everything that it did. It's everything that it, it made that agreement and purchased that price for. Now, friend, as you think about this idea, in the Bible, please understand that Christians are that blood-bought people. We're the people of God who are purchased by the blood of Jesus. Remember again, Acts 20, verse 28, Paul said to the elders to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his blood. Now, whose blood purchased that? Jesus did. Colossians 2.14 and Ephesians 2.14, Jesus made peace by the cross and the blood that was shed there. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26.28, not my blood, not your blood, not somebody else's, not some reformer. No, the blood of Jesus is what Christians are bought back with. Now, how did that blood buy us back? My friend, Jesus paid the ultimate price for my sins and yours. Listen to these words. 1 Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins in his own body upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. It's the blood of Jesus that made that sacrifice available. He's the one who paid that price. I didn't pay it. You didn't pay it. Jesus paid the ultimate price by giving his blood on Calvary. And so Christians can rejoice today that we are a blood-bought people by the sacrifice. Again, not just that red liquid substance. That's not what I want you to think about. I understand the giving of that. But more than that, by the sacrifice and by the price, nothing greater no greater love has a man than to lay down his life for his friends. John 15, verse 13. That's what we're talking about. Jesus paid the ultimate price, the ultimate gift, and bought us back to God by his blood and through his sacrifice. And so Christians are a, a blood-bought people. In the Bible, Christians are also redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Listen to Colossians chapter 1. Verse number 14, as it relates to 
our redemption and our hope in Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 14 records these words about our hope in Jesus. The Bible says this, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. It's not like we've been redeemed from our aimless conduct by silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot or blemish. He was foreordained before the foundations of the world, but was manifest, made known to you in these last times. Silver and gold, aimless tradition, ritualism of men, the, the things that man places value on that could never buy us back to God. But we have redemption in the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 7, Colossians 1 verse 14. We're bought back like a slave who is set free. You know, in the year of Jubilee, under the Old Testament, in the year of Jubilee, there's that time where every slave had the opportunity to pay that price and to be freed from his slavery. My well, friend, we were slaves to sin. Romans 6, 17 and 18. I didn't have to pay the price. Christ paid the price for me and I've been set free. God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which you were delivered. And having been set free from the slavery of sin, we became slaves or servants of righteousness. Romans 6, verse 17 and 18. And friend, as a result of that, because I have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, I'm not standing in a place of condemnation anymore. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I don't have to live a life of slavery. I don't have to live under the penalty and the perjury and the death that would come to one who's a snow. I've been freed from that by the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as we think about that idea, not only are we bought back and redeemed by the blood of Jesus, but friend, listen carefully. Christians, we're cleansed by Christ's blood. We mentioned this passage earlier, but I want you to open to it with me. Look at the cleansing agent involved in the blood of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. As we think today about contacting that blood and the power of it, I want you to notice what is said in Revelation chapter 1, verse number 5. The Bible says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, listen now, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Isn't that a beautiful picture? The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. The, the ashes of a heifer, the sprinkling of a goat, no, that wasn't su sufficient to take away sin. And yet this man, Jesus, offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down to the right hand of God. When Jesus on the cross cried out, it is finished. What was that all about? The complete sacrifice by his blood and his death was made. And friend, I'm washed and cleansed in the blood of Jesus. Well, consider this. If it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses, when do I contact his blood? That's really what we're asking today. If this blood is so essential and so important, and if forgiveness comes at the blood of Jesus, when do I contact that blood? Let's see for ourselves. Open your own Bible. I want you to open your own Bible to Romans chapter 6 with me, and let's consider that we are forgiven by the blood of Jesus and that we contact it when we obey the gospel. Look in Romans chapter 6, and I want you to notice what the Bible says beginning in verse number 1. Romans chapter 6, look with me in verses 1 through 4 of this book. How do you contact the blood of Jesus and how are you washed in his blood? The Bible says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know? that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized 
into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Friend, think about that idea for just a moment. Should I continue to live in sin that God's grace will abound? Of course not. God forbid. How can anybody who has turned his back on sin live in that? That's basically the question. And then Paul says, and by the way, remember you did that, right? Do you not know that as many of us as were, listen to these words now, as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Friend, the blood of Jesus is representative of the death and the sacrifice of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, no forgiveness of sins, something had to give its place, its life for that. Jesus gave his life, his death, the totality of that. Now watch Romans 6 verse 3 again. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, were washed in his blood, How am I washed in his blood? The blood represents the death and the sacrifice. And friend, the Bible teaches that we are buried with Christ in baptism. Romans 6 verse 4, we're buried with Christ in baptism into his death and we rise out of that to walk in newness of life. And so consider this, if the death and the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus is that essential to salvation and everybody recognizes Everyone recognizes without the blood and the sacrifice and the death of Jesus, there's no forgiveness of sins. Do we not also see that you can't access that death and contact that blood without being buried with Christ in baptism into his death? Friend, the Bible teaches that I contact the blood of Jesus that saves at the point of obedience to the gospel in baptism. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Does a person have to hear God's word and hear the message of Jesus to be saved? Absolutely. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Must a person recognize Jesus and acknowledge him as Lord and Savior and commit his life to him? Of course. Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm he, you'll surely die in your sins. John 8, verse 24. Do I have to turn from a life of sin and, and turn in God, turn to God in repentance? Peter preached, repent and be converted or turn again that your sins may be blotted out. And so there's no doubt you've got to believe in Jesus, hear the word of God, repent of sin, confess him as, as Lord and Savior of your life. But friend, that all culminates when one submits to what God teaches in baptism, and the Bible says, I contact the death and the blood of Jesus, and I'm washed in it when I'm baptized. Listen to these verses with me. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus gives the great commission to his disciples, go into all the world, preach the gospel and every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Did you know the Bible teaches that to be saved, you must believe and be baptized? Because culminating with that act of baptism, that's where we contact the blood of Jesus. Listen to what the Bible says on the day of Pentecost, when the first gospel sermon was ever preached. Peter proclaimed very powerfully, Therefore let all the house of Israel No, assuredly, God's made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the Bible says, they were pricked in their heart and they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Did you know that baptism, according to the Bible, is for the remission of sins? because we're washed in his blood and because it culminates in the act of baptism with one contacting the death of Jesus. Consider what Jesus said about this. In John chapter three, 
Verse number five, Jesus said, unless a man is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is where salvation is. It's where the saved are. It's one day going home to be with God. How do you get into the kingdom and the church of God? Unless you're born of water and the Spirit. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. Being born of water is that new birth, that bath of rebirth, Titus 3, verses 3 through 5, that occurs when we die in a sin, when we're buried with Christ in baptism, and when we arise out of that to walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And then this example. Saul of Tarsus, confronted with Jesus on the road to Damascus, when he realizes the truth, he cries out, Lord, what would you have me to do? And the Lord says to Saul, you go in the city, be told you what you must do. Paul recounts that. In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, God sends Ananias, and Ananias says to Saul, 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 uh, why are you waiting? Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, the Bible teaches that sins are washed away when we obey the gospel and when that culminating act of baptism puts us in contact with the death of Jesus. Are we saying there's something mystical or magical in the world? And that's not the idea. It's the answer of a good conscience. But the Bible also says, baptism does now also save us. First Peter chapter three, verse number 21. And so we ask you today, have you contacted that blood, that blood that saves, that blood that purchases, that blood that put the new covenant in place, and that blood that was given for me and you. If you've never obeyed the gospel, we urge you to today, and we hope you'll study more with us next time in God's powerful word. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On demand, downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.